Let's say that some people are better at languages than others. So what? So therefore, I'm not going to bother. Uh, you know, I can't hit a golf ball like Rory McIlroy. Therefore, I'm not going to play golf. Maybe some people are better. It doesn't matter. If you're interested, if you are motivated, it doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what you think your talent level is. You can learn. Everyone can learn. Some people may be better at imitating pronunciation. Some people may be better at you know remembering certain things. It doesn't matter, and it's not the main factor. The main factor always comes down to motivation and time. You are motivated, and you put in the time. You will learn. Some may learn faster. Some may pronounce better. But everyone can learn. Welcome to the New Flesh Podcast, the podcast you deserve. My name is Jonathan Astro, and uh, with me is Ricky Allpike. Ricky. Uh, bonjour. Konnichiwa. Oh, d- cultural appropriation. Uh oh. You cancelled again. <laughs> again. <laughs> again. Well. Oh no. It's. It, it is. Would you consider yourself to be um, a a multilinguist? No, I do not. Unfortunately. Oh, it was just okay. All right. Well, you. Yeah, hopefully, this episode uh, with Steve Kaufman, uh, a polyglot, um, incredible language learner, very inspirational guy. Um, hopefully that will I- inspire you to do something with your life, mate. You know, may, 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 maybe just explain what polyglot is, because some people might think it's some sort of weird fetish. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fair point. <laughs> it's just somebody could speak a bunch of languages. Um, if you thought it was something else, you're gross and weird. So that's just guilty. That's, yep, guilty as charged. All right, uh, um, uh, Steve Kaufman, let's do it. Steve Kaufman is a former Canadian diplomat and lifelong learner. In 2007, Steve and his son Mark launched Link, that's spelled L-I-N-G-Q, an app that helps people learn languages through reading and listening to native content. Steve has an understanding of 20 languages, and he's here to discuss the joys and struggles of learning languages. Steve, welcome to the New Flesh. Thank you. So, Steve, uh, I thought we'd begin, you're a polyglot, you've, you speak many languages, which we'll talk about in a second, but, uh, you, you know, we have our own uh, dialect here in Australia. I just thought I'd g- give you a couple of Australianisms and see if you, you, if you speak so many languages, maybe you could try and decipher them for us. So, there's, uh, uh, there's one that we would say, um, fair dinkum. Could you, do, could you give us an idea of what you think fair dinkum uh, means? Well, I've, I've, I've heard it and I know it's positive. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. You're that right. is good. That is yeah. good. Uh, or, that's or, it. But positive about what? Like good on your mate or something? I guess it's along those lines. I don't it, know. It, it, it means it's the real article. It's it's uh, it's uh, you know it's the real deal. I guess genuine. Yeah. yeah. When, when, yeah. It's genuine. Okay. Yeah. What about what about hard yakka? Could you could you give us an idea of what you think hard yakka is? Hard yakka? I have no idea. <laughs> Somebody who <laughs> speaks too loud, like he yaks a lot. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good That's guess. A good guess. Actually. No, it just means hard work, which you which you are no stranger to. Uh, so if someone says, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of hard yakka, that means they're they're uh, they're working really hard. Um, anyway, Steve, I won't I won't put torture you anymore through through this. Uh, uh, thank you for for being a good sport. Um, uh, to, to be honest, we looked at most of our. Unfortunately, most of our Australianisms have swearing in them, um, which is rather embarrassing. I can't think of any other other language that has so much casual swearing in it. Well, um, you'd be surprised. In Spain, they swear a lot. Really, the Spanish, not so much in South America, but the Spanish they swear a ton. <laughs> and the Cantonese, there's a lot of swearing. So it's not unique. Uh, it varies. Well, that's good to know. Uh, our, uh, we're yeah. not uh, the only ruffians. So perhaps you could give us an insight into, into, your, into your background, Steve, uh, to start off with. Well, I mean, certainly what I've been doing the last um, 20 years or so has been a major focus on language learning. Uh, you know, I started uh, this app with my son and also spending a lot of my own time learning languages. But throughout my career, you know, I was exposed to languages. Uh, I was born in Sweden. And at the age of five, my family moved to Canada. I have no recollection of transitioning from Swedish to English. It's just there were kids. We played whatever we played. And they probably didn't understand me at first. And I didn't understand them. But in short order, we were just communicating in English. And I forgot my Swedish. And then we had French at school, which I didn't really enjoy. And then I had a teacher uh, at McGill University who all of a sudden made French very interesting to me. And that just turned me into someone 
A, interested in learning languages, convinced that I could do it. Then uh, with the Canadian government, I was sent to Hong Kong to learn Mandarin Chinese. I was convinced that I could do it. I did it. Uh, then I lived in Japan. And uh, of course, when I had, I studied in France for three years, so I would hitchhike around in Spain and Germany. And I would, I just thought languages, as long as you expose yourself to enough of a language and don't overdo trying to nail down all the niceties of grammar, you can learn. So, and I learned a bunch of languages uh, while working. It was very useful to me in my work. But particularly, as I say, in the last 20 years or so, I've focused in on the whole issue of language learning. I have a, a YouTube channel where I talk about language learning, uh, try to encourage people to learn languages, uh, try to encourage them not to be too hard on themselves, not to be too demanding, and don't criticize others. And whatever you learn, you're going to forget. So don't worry about it. <laughs> that kind of message. Mm. And and how many languages uh, do you speak? So, oh, sorry, what, what languages do, do you speak, I should say? Well, what language? So in, in sort of declining order of proficiency, you know, obviously English, French, Japanese, Mandarin, Spanish, Swedish, maybe German. And then it starts to get a little worse, you know, Italian, Portuguese, uh, Russian, Ukrainian. Uh, and then it gets even worse, like Korean. And our languages that I learned well enough to speak when I was in the country, like uh, Czech or Romanian, and which I haven't spoken now for a while, so it would be difficult. And yet I can understand, I can read when I get, you know, I follow different people on Twitter in Czech. Uh, I, I know what they're talking about. Um, now I'm preparing to go to Poland, so I'm listening to an audio book on the history of Poland, and my Polish isn't bad. I know a lot of words. Uh, what, about, what did I leave out there? The, oh, Persian, I spent a fair amount of time on Persian and Arabic. Arabic is very difficult. Persian's a lot easier. Um, yeah, so you add it all up, it comes to like 20 or so in varying degrees of, you know, work in progress. Well, that's about nine, 19 more than me, so... Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have an ulterior motive, Steve, uh, for getting you on the show uh, because I want everyone listening to this episode to consider learning a new language. Um, so maybe if we start macro, wh why do you think people should... Uh, take go on a, a language learning journey well I, I it's hard to say that people should you know people are interested in different things some people are interested in bird watching or some people are uh, you know iron man <laughs> athletes or something it depends whatever turns your crank but language learning is very rewarding because all of a sudden you are able to penetrate another culture another point of view, another way of looking at the world. Uh, so you learn all of those things, which I think makes us a little bigger because we have that other, those other perspectives. If you're lucky enough, I mean, you might run in, if you're learning uh, Spanish and you run into someone from Argentina or Mexico and you can chat them up in the language, that's fine. But even if that doesn't happen, as you're learning the language, you're learning so much about people who share this planet with us while we're on it, you know, and who have different cultures and different uh, perspectives. So I just find it, it's enjoyable. Uh, it, it's not like, how quickly can I learn the language to me? Because to me, the process is enjoyable and the process should be made enjoyable. And unfortunately, the way languages are taught, which is kind of the cart before the horse, because Teachers try to teach you a bunch of theoretical explanations of how the language works before you've had enough of the language in you. And that doesn't work. You actually have to get the language in you through a lot of listening and reading, not worrying about things you don't quite understand. Let the bombard the brain with the language. The brain will kind of start to figure things out. And then if you start to explain how the language works, at least it relates to something that you have already experienced. But language teachers are not that way. You know, the system is, system is, I'm a teacher, I teach you something, I test you on it, I give you a mark. So that's not a very good way to get people motivated to learn languages. But if it's done in an enjoyable way, it's just a very enjoyable voyage of discovery. And you can repeat it. You can do it for one language and then another and another. Mm. Well, we're, we're going to dig down to exactly how you learn a language a little bit later in the interview. But do you think that language could be one possible unifying force in these polarized times? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> because you have only to look at the former Yugoslavia oh. or, or Ar Northern Ireland, Ireland, or even now, you know, the Ukrainians and the Russians, they understand each other. 
Uh, so no, I, I would love to think that, but uh, there's no evidence of that. Well, that's that's a shame, Steve, because we have a very partic- we've got sort of a very fractious relationship with our our, uh, our one of our nearest neighbours, China. Yeah, and a lot of our a lot of our major issues have have sort of arised out of um, what appears to be communication breakdowns between you know that i feel like the people i think you need to train some of the people in their uh, in their press corps because the some of the statements they've put out over the couple of years that have caught that i've been i just sit there and go this is terrible warlike language (laughs) that we're being given on our side i'm i wonder if we were taught if we were taught Mandarin from from a very young, like you know, we were able to really bridge, lay down a golden bridge. I wondered if if that was going to make anything better. But you're saying it wouldn't really matter. It wouldn't really matter. Um, I mean, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people in China are very antagonistic towards the West. So, and there are a number of reasons for this. It can be because of the history of colonialism. Uh, which was a great, you know, lots of face for China, this great, you know, 5,000 year old culture, which is again, one of these slogans that they trot out, which there, there's nothing really that happened 5,000 years ago that would enable them to claim that they're 5,000 years old and some other culture isn't, but it's part of their thing. So they have this whole image of themselves as this tremendously powerful country and, and they feel they should have like, you have to like I can read some of the things they write. You know, it's very unfair that the white man got out there and colonized all these places, and we were asleep at the switch, and now we're a little bit late. I mean, seriously. Now, the white man, of course, had a very colonialist approach to you know the rest of the world, and there's lots there to criticize and justification for feeling uh, resentment towards you know the Western world for you know. You know, why is Australia English speaking instead of Chinese speaking? If the Chinese had gotten there before the English, that would all be theirs. So there's a sense of resentment. There's nothing you can do about that. That's there. Um, I would say that many of the leaders in China studied in the US or in Europe. So it's not a lack of language. Uh, There are sort of national aspirations that are on a collision course the the you know america the u.s likes to think of themselves as and you'll see, you'll hear it on their tv stations you know the greatest country in the history of the world which is an amazing thing to say <laughs> and they say it all the time the greatest country in the history of the world not old persian empire china under the time not not the, the roman empire no the united states total history 250 years or whatever the greatest country in the history of the world. So you, you definitely have a collision of uh, national, uh, you know, arrogance. And so, I mean, by all rights, China should be the, China and India should be the dominant countries in the world. Uh, together, they're almost 50% of the population of the world. Uh, in terms of history, I mean, you know, China and India, I mean, with so much science, so much philosophy, so much thought there, and not only there, I mean, in so many other places as well. I was just reading that, you know, the Greeks figured out that the earth was round. The Greeks, or a Greek, figured out that the uh, actually the earth rotates around the sun. The Chinese never did because it went against some of their Confucianist beliefs. So, you, again, you have this, it's like the same in Europe. Like, the Greeks discovered a bunch of stuff. Then the uh, <laughs> Catholic religion came in and basically squashed all that stuff and it didn't come back until Copernicus or whatever. So, so, I mean, but there's so much out there. There's so many centers of history of world history and, but certainly China and India are giants historically. And so the idea that, that they're not going to be allowed to become at least an equal, but they don't want to be, the Chinese are not, they're not sort of structured to be equal. Their mindset is, I'm either better than you or not as good as you. And this is just how they are. And so there are some real issues. Uh, I think if we have more people who can communicate with the Chinese, if we can find a dialogue that says, 
yes, you will be more and more uh, powerful. You don't have to do it in a way that's antagonistic to us. Uh, we welcome that. But by the same token, you can't can take over the whole of the South China Sea. Even, it's, if, even though it's called the South China Sea, it's not yours. So there are clashes uh, over, you know, and a similar, like the U.S. used to have this Monroe Doctrine. You know, any, anybody who does anything in the Western Hemisphere, we're going to bop them over the head. Well, all those countries in the Western Hemisphere, they're independent countries. It's like Russia saying we're going to remove Ukraine from the history of the world like it never existed. Yeah, but the Ukrainians have a right to decide. So there are, unfortunately, inevitably, these conflicting um, national ambitions. And they're much larger than language issues. Mm. Much larger. So unfortunately, no, I don't see that. I don't see that. Do you, do you I just got a wonderful insight into your uh, perspective. Uh, you, you referenced a range of different uh, cultures and histories there. Do you think that that has come, that, that unique perspective has come out of your, your language learning over a long period of time? Well, sure, because if you, you know, so you start learning a language, it's like I start learning Persian. So then you, and we have a collaborator at Link, we have a collaborator in Iran, this lady who she produced like 26 episodes on the history of Iran in somewhat simplified language. And it's just so fascinating. And then you realize how important the center of world history, Central Asia, Iran, Central Asia has been. And you realize the extent to which they were influenced by, you know, Greek culture. Alexander the Great conquered that part of the world. And then I India and, and, and Buddhism and, and China and, and, of course, Islam. And so you begin to realize that that's a major center. And a thousand years ago, that was a major center of learning. They were far more advanced than uh, Europe was at the time. And uh, I don't know, it just gives you, you start to look at things. But unfortunately, there have always been conflicts. Uh, you know, diverging interests. And uh, and the fact that you speak the language of the other group, unfortunately, doesn't mean that those fundamental differences won't be there. Y you hope that those differences can be resolved. That's what we hope, right? But, uh, but th there's a fundamental issue. Like, for example, if you look at China, um, I don't know if it's half or a significant part of China, are territories that historically were not areas where the Chinese, the Han Chinese lived. These are areas that were taken over when the Manchus ruled China, which is the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty. So that's Mongolia, which now became independent, but Inner Mongolia, uh, Xinjiang, which is uh, you know where the Uyghurs live, and Tibet. So from a strategic point of view, the Chinese do not want those people to have any independence. In fact, they want to dilute them so that those people are China, whatever the local aspirations might be, because it's in their strategic interest to not have those areas, which are rich in resources and blah, 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 have any independence. So how do you deal with a moral issue that they're in fact suppressing the rights of those peoples how do you sort of deal with that and China's strategic interest to control and uh, not want to have any kind of separatist movements in those territories? So it's very difficult, very, very difficult. And it gets very emotional. And, you know, they, I remember I, I toured uh, China when I, uh, I published a book in China. And uh, I remember, uh, of course, if you publish a book in China, you're dealing with the Chinese Communist Party. But you don't publish in China if you're not connected with the Chinese Communist Party. And so I was with this guy, and his specialty was Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs are. And he made a big deal. For, you know, the Uyghurs, they're actually Asian because they have the Mongol mark, you know, on the back, on their back. Like, and I said to myself, like, so what? Not everyone who is, a, you know, not every, probably the Kyrgyz and the Kazakhs have it too. That doesn't mean they're Chinese. But there's a sort of trying to prove somehow that racially, like whatever, they're Chinese and stuff, constantly grinding. So it's a very, very difficult issue. So, you know, you've got China's legitimate aspirations to be a powerful economic force and to have allies around the world. And you have some legitimate moral issues in China, which they can also, you know, 
basically deflect and say, well, what about the white man killing all those Indians or aboriginals <laughs> or Maoris? Oh, the, you, Steve, you, you have just brought up, this is their favorite uh, Trump card. Like, you know, like to, to, you could say, you could have any legitimate criticism and they just go, oh, isn't, don't you think you're a bit racist? Then you say, oh, for goodness sakes. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's true if you go back in time. So then the question is, so you're saying that what you're doing now is equivalent to what the settlers did in the U.S. or Canada, how they, you know, basically they, they came in and they took over the place. So they beat up on the locals with more or less violence, depending on the situation. And that wasn't very nice. And uh, so, but then you're doing it now. You, I would say to the Chinese, you know, you're doing it now. Yes, this was done 150 years ago. But anyway, all I'm saying is that these are the things that they will bring up. Absolutely. Well, this is all, all, all fascinating stuff, Steve, all, all this, this, this background knowledge into history. And I feel like, you know, the whole episode, we could go off on a tangent. On, We're going to get on, you back on, on just geo- to talk about geopolitics, yeah, that's right. Steve. Yes. But, but, but for now, b- back to language. Yeah. I know, John, you'll, you'll be very, ups- very upset if this episode is not about language. But um, what's, uh, you, you did mention that you learnt French as a kid and you spent 10 years doing so and, and you didn't gain much ground. So I, I guess one thing we want to know is, is what's wrong with classroom learning? Uh, because I, I think most people would see learning a language in a classroom setting as kind of the gold standard of, of language learning. Um, so, so what, what do you think of that? Well, uh, first of all, you have to understand that you learn, it sounds silly to say this, but you, you learn languages in your brain, wherever your brain is, that's where you're going to learn. You don't have to learn in the classroom. That's point number one. Your brain is very good at learning things. In fact, the brain is made to learn things. That's what it's for. The brain picks up on patterns. That's how we get through life because we experience certain things so that the next time something similar happens, we have a sense of how to react. The brain is helping us adjust. So there's different patterns. And that's exactly how the brain deals with language. So if you give the brain enough exposure to the language, the brain is going to start putting some patterns together. So the important thing is, A, that the owner of the brain wants to learn the language. So therefore, the attitude of the learner is tremendously important. The second thing is that the brain gets enough exposure to the language, not to a teacher explaining stuff in English, but actual exposure to the raw stimulus of the language. And the brain will actually start to form patterns. That's what the brain is for. And and, and the brain will start to notice more and more things because as you know in life, once you've noticed a few things, then you notice some other things that you didn't notice before. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. Certain things fall into place, then we notice some other things. So the trouble with high sc- or the school language teaching is that there's pressure on the learner to get some things right. Get things right that the learner is unlikely to get right because it actually takes quite a while for the brain to get used to these patterns of the new language. There is even a natural order, people think, whereby we learn things in the language. And some of these take a long time. So test, to test someone on these, just because the teacher taught it, and then they have the learner, like the good students will work very hard and they'll get eight out of 10, and the poor students will get four out of 10. But it's, it's a lot of pressure and, and tension for little benefit. Uh, it sh- language learning should be focused more on listening and reading or watching movies, more input, getting lots of exposure, year after year exposure, hopefully to interesting things hopefully things that motivate the learner. And so the learner is key and listening and, and teaching the learner to accept uncertainty. You're not going to understand it all. I'm not going to ask you comprehension questions. I don't care how much you understand. Uh, you're just going to take it in, understand certain things. Over time, you'll understand more things. And at some point when you're curious, you can ask about why the language does this, although nowadays you can Google and find you know, French verbs or Spanish pronouns or whatever you want. Everything is available if you're interested. But the teacher can start explaining things after the fact. But there's far too much pressure on uh, the sort of like teach, test, teach and test uh, in schools. Whereas I would remove testing because 
I'm sure Australia is no different than the English language school system in Canada, where 10 years of schooling, the good students get good marks, the poor students get lousy marks, but few of either group actually ends up speaking the language. So all of that testing didn't amount to much. And if instead those learners had been allowed to enjoy the language, and nowadays not even like very often in school say, well, we don't have a Spanish teacher, so we can only teach you French. Yeah, but there's so much stuff on the internet. If the student is more interested in Spanish or Chinese, let them study what they're interested in, give them more and more exposure, that would make more sense. But what they do right now is is not very effective. It's uh, stressful. It uh, discourages people. And I think a lot of people are convinced that they can't learn languages because of the way they're taught at school. Well, I did a, a, a stint at a language school, uh, one group lesson per week. And I found that the pace of the learning was glacial, um, that it would take many years to reach any sort of fluency at the, at the pace they were going at. Also, the group format wasn't ideal as I found myself talking with other unskilled mm-hmm. students rather than native speakers. Um, it was also quite expensive. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, this is this is slightly different to the, the school experience, but I think it's what a lot of adult learners will be, will be thinking of. So wh- why are people drawn to, to this method of learning? Well, first of all, I think a lot of people at some level would like to learn another language. Lots, lots of people. Um, so what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to go to the local library or you know, community college or whatever and, and take a course. And you go down there, you meet people, and it becomes quite a social, you know, it's a, you know, you meet people, you get to know people, it's fun. The trouble is exactly what you said. First of all, it's quite expensive. Second of all, it takes you a half hour to get there, half hour to get home. So it's not very time effective. And I am not in favor of speaking to people who speak, either they speak much better than I do, in which case I'm intimidated, or they speak very poorly, in which case I don't want to hear them. And the thing about language learning is it's, Effective language learning is essentially based on a lot of input. Input is something you can do on your own anytime you want. So you're exposing the brain to the language. Once you have a certain toehold on the language, now you can start speaking. And then I would speak only one-on-one, and I would speak to native speakers. Even though it's become sort of now the sort of politically correct, you know, native speakers aren't necessarily the best teachers. Yeah, but I want to talk to a native speaker. If I'm learning Chinese, I don't want to speak to an American. I want to speak to a Chinese person. Uh, If I'm learning Thai, I want to speak to a Thai person. So get to a certain level in the language and then start speaking, which is now easy to do online. But it's it's much more of a, you know, uh, how would I put it? It's a lonely journey at first. It's and maybe a lot of people aren't up for that. They want to go and talk to people. And but when you go to some kind of a group language class and you're using the same limited vocabulary, you never get past that. Whereas if you are listening to material, and I can get into how link works, but you're listening to material, you're constantly increasing your vocabulary. You're constantly bombarding your brain with the language, how the language works. Uh, and, and you're growing. And, and then when you're at a certain level where you have a certain level of comprehension, now go and have an adult conversation, hopefully with a native speaker, and then you will continue to grow because that native speaker will use words you haven't heard before and you're growing now. But you have to you have to have a certain level to be able to do that. And I've seen, especially in Japan, they do a lot of this. They all sit around and they basically use the same limited vocabulary over and over and over again, and it doesn't do much. Do you think that bad high school experiences with languages put people off language, learning languages for, for a lifetime? Uh, I think it, it does. I think it does. Um, now, you know, the question is, how do you motivate people? If the person isn't motivated, then it doesn't uh, matter. You know, if you compare, say, you know, what do you remember? Like, if you're not in math, how much do you remember of your high school trigonometry, you know? So you learn stuff to pass the exam. So to motivate someone to stay with language learning so that they continue learning languages, mm. uh, it's not going to be everyone. So, but if I were a teacher, my my number one goal is how do I motivate people? You've, it's not, it's not, will they pass the test to the, can I get, show the parents they got high marks? Cause I, I know that that's basically a mirage. Uh, the thing is, how can you motivate people to learn? 
I think you've got to give them choice. You've got, there's got to be flexibility. There's got to be a lot of input, minimize. I mean, I think our comprehension questions are very annoying. It basically ruin the pleasure, the enjoyment of listening or, listening or reading. Um, so I think, yeah, some people are discouraged. Maybe some people are just not interested too. So it's, it's hard to say. But the problem is the model is to learn a language, I've got to go to school. So that's what's ha what happens. So then they look up a local school and, and it isn't cheap. Like $500 a month, $1,000 a month, not to mention the cost of getting there. And it's very ineffective. There's no question that you can learn faster on your own if you're motivated. There are so many resources available on the internet uh, mm. that the, the, the classroom doesn't even come close. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned uh, watching movies and, and reading as sort of a key aspect to, to learning a language or, 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 or perhaps a good tool to learn languages. Uh, I, I think of my experience learning, uh, I spent a lot of time in, in primary school and high school learning Indonesian. And sadly, I, I don't oh, yeah. know as much as I probably should after all those years. But uh, having you, you know, you mentioned movies, I think as, as, a, as a teenager, as a boy, I think I would have really appreciated watching interesting movies, even if they were cartoons or stuff, you know, in, in that native language in Indonesian. And I wonder if, if that would also maybe incorporate video games at some stage, like if that's sort of something that, that would motivate people to kind of Yeah, learn. I mean, it depends on how people are motivated. I know there are a lot of people who are motivated to learn Japanese because of anime. I am not at all interested in video games. <laughs> I have no idea <laughs> if that would be helpful. Uh, I do believe that the, the most effective sort of activities are listening and reading, even more so than movies. Movies are more motivating because it's fun. Okay, mm. you, here's Indonesia. You've got this uh, little river flowing through the countryside and Indonesia doing their dance or whatever. Right? It doesn't matter, but it's motivating. It's exotic. It's fun. But... The, the the audio like a podcast it's just words so you have to conjure up the meaning with just relying on words and i always and i do a lot of listening but everything i listen to i have to read i, I have to have a transcript because if you just listen you won't understand but if you listen and then you can look up you can read the transcript and you can look up words and then you can listen again and you understand a little bit more so that eventually you can get to where it's actually enjoyable to listen. So you do have to have the transcript. The trouble with movies is that there's generally a lot of action and, and less dialogue. And so you're kind of almost distracted from the language, but it mm. is fun and it is motivating. So it's definitely a part of the strategy. But if you're looking you know, to learn as quickly as possible, I would rely on listening and reading. So, John, you were commenting about talking to people, you know, having this conversation group with people who don't speak very well. I agree with you. I think that's a waste of time. You're using a very limited vocabulary and you're not advancing. You want to be doing a lot of listening and reading, building up your familiarity with the language, building up your comprehension. And then when you're at a fair level, try to take on the native speaker and speak, you know, have adult conversations rather than going around around the same subject all the time. So, the, and there again, that's a lot of listening. Cause if you're speaking, if you're having an adult conversation, you're getting a lot of input from that person. So you may not actually be able to hold up much end of, uh, much of your end of the conversation, but you can trigger stuff. And then it comes back at you from the native speaker. And you're very keen to understand what he's saying because it's important to you now. It's, it's you're in a real conversation and all of those things are very good. High resonance type learning situations, but, but movies are, movies can be quite motivating. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested to sort of know how the education system got, got to this point in, uh, in, in, uh, in relation to languages, because everything you're describing sounds like how, uh, you know, if you were to immigrate, to immigrate to another country or spend a long time in a country, these are the kind of things, this is how you would learn the language. You'd be around people speaking it. You would just be exposed to it absolutely everywhere. So I feel like we've, we've known this since the dawn of time that this is how you learn a language but then when we go to school it's a very different thing so is is that just uh, a consequence of the education system and testing and that that sort of mindset is is that is that why we learn languages at school like that yeah and i think too i think a lot of us think of learning as something that you know a teacher imparts knowledge so the teacher is the source uh people don't necessarily think about learning things on their own and yet today, 
I mean, if I need to learn something, whether it be how to improve my golf swing or fixing my uh, coffee maker, or whatever, I just go to YouTube. And, and there's all kinds of stuff there that can help you. If I'm interested in something in history, I just look it up and I get, wow, a lot of stuff. So I, I think there's so much more information available today that, that I think the, uh, the center of gravity has shifted from the teacher to the individual, to the learner. And, but I think the pattern for language learning is the same as with all other languages, with all other subjects, that the teacher is the source of all wisdom and I can't do anything on my own and I need to be helped. And where do I go for help? I go to the teacher, I go in a classroom and, and I see it with immigrants in Canada. We know, we know people from China, whatever, friends of ours, and I try to get them interested in using Link and learning on their own. They don't want it. They want to go to a classroom. They want to have their hand held. They think they're doing something. If they go to a classroom, I did this, I went to classroom. In the end, they don't improve very much. Whereas the person who didn't go to a lot of classrooms but ended up getting a job with a Canadian, you know, like a mainstream employer, not a Chinese employer, and therefore had to speak English all day at work, well, that person learns. And the person that goes yeah. to the government-sponsored language class but uh, only you know, has Chinese friends, they don't learn. Like the, the government-sponsored language class is just a waste of time. So... We've talked about a little bit about motivation and uh, I guess time, uh, which you have talked about motivation and time. Mm. But what what about the the ability to notice? What do you what do you mean when you talk about the ability to notice when learning a language? Well, first of all, um, you know the the guru of language acquisition is a gentleman called Stephen Krashen out of UCLA. He tends to feel that this ability to notice is not a real thing. But I, I think it is a thing. And if you want to notice, you're going to notice more. And the more you listen to the language and the more you're motivated to notice, the more new things you're going to notice. Uh, so, you know, for example, I, uh, at Link, we have these mini stories with a lot of repetition. And uh, when I start into a language, I'll listen to these stories 30, 40, 50 times. Not at one sitting, but... You know, lesson, you know, story one, two, three, four, five, back to lesson one. And then I go off and do more difficult things, podcast. Then I come back to the mini story. Every time I listen to the mini story, I notice something that I hadn't noticed before. A structure, a word, an ending. We're constantly noticing things if we're motivated to notice. And the more things we already know, the more new things we're going to notice. So it's also a function the, the ability to notice is, a, in fact, a function of your motivation and a function of how much you have exposed yourself to the language, how much you've listened and read and read, how many things you already now take for granted so that other new things now stand out to you and you start to notice them. So it's a natural thing. You can't sit there and say, I'm going to notice. You're going to notice. If you're listening, a lot of things pass you by and all of a sudden you notice something and then you start to notice it somewhere else. And that's just this natural process of notice, noticing more and more things in, in terms of how the language works. Well, you mentioned uh, the app Link there. Uh, perhaps mm -hmm. you could tell us a little bit more about how it works, the structure of it, uh, the philosophy behind it, perhaps. And, and, and how did you come up with the idea? Well, uh, so I believe very much in input-based learning. You've got to get the language in you, listening and reading. And as I said, Stephen Krashen is the guru on this, and he explains it you know, very in a way that's very easy to understand. But long before I ever heard of Stephen Grashen, I had books at home in Spanish and German and other languages where I had gone through, I was trying to read them and I was underlining the words that I, I didn't know. And typically I would look those words up and then I would close the dictionary and I immediately forgot whatever was in the dictionary. And sometimes I would make lists and I never learned any of them. They constantly remained underlined words that I didn't know. And so when I became aware of, you know, obviously when I was learning Chinese, we had these big open reel uh, tape recorders. And all of a sudden they went to mini discs, well, cassette players, you know, the spaghetti, and then, uh, and then the mini disc player, and then the, the uh, MP3 player. So between, with MP3 technology, online dictionaries, all of a sudden, you know, the opportunity to learn language was, was dramatically improved. And so it, it's with that in mind that we started Link. And along the way, I discovered Stephen Krashen, which just confirmed the way I had always learned languages. Lots of listening and reading, Chinese, Japanese, whatever. I was always listening and reading. And Link just makes it easier to do because on Link, 
So we have a lot of content in our libraries, like the mini stories that get you started, where there's a lot of repetition of high frequency verbs. Uh, but and then at some point you're able to go beyond that. So you could import your podcast. I can import anything that has audio and a transcript. Now, unfortunately, most podcasts don't have transcripts. But uh, where there's uh, anything, you know, YouTube, we can, with a click, bring anything in from YouTube where they have automatically generated subtitles in the target language. So you're all of a sudden you can access anything, newspaper articles, uh, videos, podcasts, TV programs, and you bring it in. And so within Link, we have this, a range of functions where you're, you're clicking on words, the words change in color. We have different uh, statistics that generate from that to motivate you, you know, maintaining your streak. You've got uh, some of the stuff that they have at the Duolingo and elsewhere, but in our case, it's based on content that you have chosen that you actually want to learn from rather than sort of random sentences, which is more of a Duolingo pattern. And so it's just a convenient place. There's a lot of content in Link, and you can import anything you want into Link. We're looking at different ways that we can access podcasts by automatically generating transcripts, because most podcasters don't provide transcripts. Unfortunately, most podcasters don't want you to grab their MP3 file, which is another issue, but we're looking at how we can do that in a way that the podcasters are happy because they get your, traffic. Your, your, your English learners get... uh, can have all of our uh, MP3s if, if of our podcast if they want. <laughs> oh, well, super. Okay, well, that's super. <laughs> well, when we got to get to where we can actually generate tra accurate transcripts, automatically generate transcripts. But yeah, I mean, I find that's a real problem. I go on to, uh, there's some wonderful podcasts and I used to be able to get the MP3 file for say Arabic and now they, they won't let me have the, you know, they block it. So whatever. But, but anyway, so these are the things that we try to look at at Link. How can we take advantage of the incredible amount of content that's out there uh, and massage it into a format so that the learners don't have to go looking for it because it's, it's so time consuming. And then provide them with a range of functionality that enables them to access more interesting, more demanding material earlier. So that if they go three months with our mini stories in whatever, Spanish, then they can now branch off into uh, more interesting material, but we make it less frustrating to deal with stuff that has a lot of unknown words in it. So we break it down into sentence by sentence. We have audio for each sentence. We have uh, all kinds of functionality. I, you know, I, I couldn't describe all the functionality, but it becomes a very pleasant, to me at least, convenient place and for the people who use link it becomes like an addictive place to be where you can learn from what's in our libraries or you can bring it in it becomes your sort of workspace when it comes to learning languages you can connect with the tutor within link or you can go there are other places that have online tutors so you can find online tutors to talk to but so link is more sort of focused in on the the input side of things you know enabling you to basically level up your language capability so then you can go off and find people to interact with and you sort of build up a a um a bank of words in link and i you have you i right. I, I went uh, i did the first 60 well uh mini stories in japanese so i i feel like i had oh, a lot yeah. a, a, a huge uh um uh, engagement with the, with the app over quite a period of time uh, and I would listen to so on my off times I would listen listen to the, those stories and then I would have more deliberate times when I would sit down and read them and sort of work my way through mm -hmm. exactly and and so when you build up this bank of words do you, you know do, when do you sort of hit a saturation point where you feel that you've you've got a real handle uh, on the on the language in terms of words well f first of all you are never satisfied okay that <laughs> doesn't matter whatever language you're never as good as you would like to be there's always going to be words that you forgot or ne have never learned or structures that continue to confuse you and so you're never quite satisfied but uh i think that once you've got 30 or forty thousand words now remember at link we count words Every form of the word is a different word. So if we were talking about English, run, ran, runs, running, those are different words. 
So you can build up a, a quite a large word count quite quickly because all these different you know inflections are counted as different words. But I found that you need to be about thirty or forty thousand. That's that's a good number. But I start talking to people when I'm at five thousand. But then I continue uh, to to do a lot of input. Uh, the one thing about that, you know, so all these words that you have looked up and saved, they're in your database. They're in your database. They may be yellow words, which means you're still trying to learn them. You haven't quite learned them. They're not known. They could be white because you've now, you no longer look that word up when you see it because you know what it means, but they're all in your database. And the way I look at it, it's kind of like in your memory reserve. So not everything in your memory reserve can you retrieve. But it is in your brain somewhere. And that's the way it is at Link. You got this great database of words that you have at some point seen and looked up and maybe learned and forgotten and looked up again and forgotten, but it all sits there. And I find if I go back to a language that I haven't looked at for a long time, very quickly it all comes back to me. It comes back to me because it is in fact in my memory reserve. And also it's in that, call it my hard disk, which is the, uh, my database on link where all those words are there. They're still there. And uh, maybe words that I used to think I knew now I don't know them, but I look them up again and very quickly it all comes back. So I, I think having that large database of words is, is very important. Well, I've, I've been thinking about the role of technology in, in communication, uh, particularly uh, in preparation for this interview. And programs like Google Translate are making it easier to communicate in a different language without knowing anything mm -hmm. about that language or about that culture even. Uh, I, I guess I have two, two questions on this. Will, will Google make language learning obsolete? And on, on a more philosophical level, what, what will hum humans lose as a result if, if that happens? Well, I don't think it'll make language learning obsolete. In fact, I did a video about Elon Musk's, whatever he calls it, where he plants a chip in your brain, uh, Neuralink, okay? Where he was saying, well, language will be obsolete. We'll just communicate. Boom. Telepathically, yeah. <laughs> uh, telepathically, or, or no, electronically, from your Neuralink to a computer and from the computer to someone else's right. Neuralink. I, I don't see that. Google Translate, I'll, I'll, I find that... Um, the technology is helping. Technology is making it easier to learn languages. Um, Google Translate, I use Google Translate all the time. Uh, if I'm on link and I can look up an individual word, I'll typically go to a dedicated dictionary for that language. But sometimes I don't quite get the meaning of the sentence. Google Translate will give, give me a meaning for the sentence. Nothing is perfect. The individual word that I looked up in the dictionary may not match this context. The sentence translation that Google Translate gives me may not be perfect, but Google Translate is getting better all the time. So it helps from that point of view. Uh, you know, I can communicate now, like to me, you know, it's a nuisance to type in French with accents and then in some other language with accents and in Chinese and Chinese characters. I just dictate. I dictate into my iPad so I can communicate. I'm still communicating in the language, but it's just, it's made easier to communicate, but it's not going to substitute. Like I was in Vietnam and I tried to learn a bit of Vietnamese, but I got nowhere. But if I was really stuck, I could speak into my iPhone in English and out comes something in Vietnamese. And that I think they were, you know, there was even a text to speech in, in, in Vietnamese that came out. But how much, are, how much time are you going to spend doing that? You know, if you sit beside someone in an airplane who happens to be a speaker of a language that you know, you can have a conversation, you know, or at a bar or in a restaurant or wherever. You're not going to, how, how much time are you going to spend with your, you know, speaking into Google Translate? So I don't see it as a substitute at all. It's, it's, it's helpful. Uh, artificial intelligence, like I'll go and grab a podcast in Persian and put it on this uh, automatic transcription website. And now I've got a 90% accurate transcript that I can import into Link along with the MP3 file and I can learn from it. That's, a, that's uh, AI, that's artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I did a, a video on, on chat GPT. I, I don't know, I, I, you know, there's so much content out there that I, I don't know that we need chat GPT to create content for us that's gonna be artificial. You know, yeah, you can talk to chat GPT. I don't wanna talk to chat GPT. I wanna listen and read 
and then I'll find a real person to talk to. But other people may want to talk to Chat GPT. I don't like Chat. I don't. I don't like Chat GPT's politics, Steve. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I haven't tried them on politics, but uh, yeah, they're they're gathering stuff from all over the place and throwing it together. Like I asked Chat GPT, give me ten examples of the instrumental case in Russian, and they got three of them wrong out of ten. Now I'm sure that in time they'll get better. Like, and uh, but you can't expect. You, that, yeah, I mean, they're going to come up with something that doesn't maybe doesn't match your policy. I don't know where they stand. Don't look, don't look, don't look into issues. it, Steve. It's not good. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I, I was thinking um, going back to going back to basics. So, can, can you talk us? Let's just say you were starting a, uh, a you're a new language learner. Can you talk us through your process for learning a, a, a language from scratch? First of all, is that language, how similar is that language to a language you speak? That's a big deal. Uh, obviously, if it's written in the Latin alphabet, it's going to be a lot easier because we are all used to the Latin alphabet. That's what we spent our whole life, you know, reading. And if you have to learn another al alphabet, it's more difficult. Uh, how much common vocabulary is there? If there's a, if it's, you know, French or Spanish, you're going to see a lot of common vocabulary. So you'll, you'll be progressing quite quickly. But typically what I do, even with something like Arabic and Persian, there I spend a little bit of time trying to figure out the writing system, realizing that it's going to take me a long time to be comfortable. But I at least have to get started. So once I got some sense of what the letters mean, then I just go to the many stories. I just focus on the many stories. Because I don't necessarily need to know how to say hello, how are you. I don't need to know the colors. I don't need to know you know, names of vegetables, any of the stuff that they normally put in beginner books is irrelevant, really. You, know, you don't need to learn those things up front. You, I just want to jump into a situation. So the many stories are kind of situations. We had a gal write the, those stories for us and we use them in all the different languages and, and they're kind of silly, but the focus was high frequency verbs, go, come, want, need, those kinds of verbs. You need those to speak. And as you know, in the many stories, the, the words repeat about five times because you've got he and then I and then a question and a negative answer, a positive answer. And so I would spend, I'll spend from three to six months on the many stories until I get tired of them. And if I check my stats on link, I'll see that I've listened to them, especially the earlier ones, 30, 40 times because I go one, two, three, four, five, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? And so I do one story, which is like meaningless. I look up words, I listen to it, I understand nothing, I read it again, then there's a couple of words that start to stick, you know, and or he or she or something. And the first story is the toughest. To try to get any kind of a toehold is very tough initially. If you're lucky enough to be doing a language that has a lot of common vocabulary, you'll get a lot of freebies. So if you're going to French or Spanish, there's lots of words there that you know, right? 50% of the words are common, more or less identifiable. But if you're going to Finnish, there'll be none, right? And if you're going to Persian, there's none and you can't read it. So it takes a lot longer. Uh, but three to six months on the mini stories, and then I start, you know, looking for things in our own library at Link. But the process is always the same. Listen and read, and I will do them in sentence mode. Like I think we have the sentence mode. So I go one sentence at a time. It's a lot easier than dealing with the whole text. One sentence at a time. Hopefully, and in most cases, in the many stories, they are properly time stamped so that I can actually hear the natural voice for the sentence. Because if you have to deal with the, the you know, the text to speech, it's not very pleasant. So you listen to the, the natural voice, you hear it over and over again. And there's a lot of repetition initially to get started. And you just have to have a lot of patience to get started. And you have to trust. I mean, imagine me starting into Arabic and Persian, more or less at the same time, not able to read. They don't give you vowels, uh, just a bunch of squigglies. There's just noise. And, but I know that eventually it will be meaning for me. But people who haven't done that and who aren't confident, they may give up. But I just stay with it. And lo and behold, in a month or two, the first mini story, which was just noise, is starting to be meaning. Starting to be meaning, but I've read it five times. I've listened to it twenty times. I've looked up the words. I've gone through it sentence by sentence. Uh, we even have this thing where you reconfigure the sentence 
you do different, you know, a lot of this sort of dealing with the, the bits and pieces of the language that you have to do in the early stages, you don't have to do later on when you can just allow your brain to, you know, fill in the blanks kind of thing. Well, a, a lot of us lead busy lives and perhaps don't have a lot of time to devote to language learning. But So what would be your advice on, on maximizing the time spent learning a language? Like what are the most important things to focus on? Well, uh, rely on your ability to listen. Uh, I, can, I have on my iPhone in I don't know how many languages, audio and text content that would make any university language lab of say 20 years ago, we would put that language lab to shame. You know, you, we have an ability to carry with us so much stuff. I get up in the morning, I listen. First thing I do, uh, I prepare breakfast, I'm listening. Uh, depending on where I am in the language, it could be uh, you know, a beginner mini story, it could be some podcast that I subscribe to, or maybe nowadays so many of these different publishers, they have apps, so I can be li listening to an audiobook on a Polish or a Swedish uh, you know, audio book, audio and ebook app, for example. There's so many different ways. And when you listen, when I listen, there's lots of things that I don't understand. So the listening is not only good for you, but it triggers your curiosity. So then at some point, uh, I'm going to have to sit down and read through that because there's so much there that I didn't understand. So the re and, but the listening is so good. And, and, uh, and if I'm standing in line uh, waiting for something, I can go and look up words, you know. Uh, to me, the listening is something I do when I'm doing something else. Listening is when I'm cleaning up, when I'm uh, doing stuff around the house. So if I go for a run, if I go to the gym, I'm listening. If I have sort of dedicated time, I'm waiting. I'm going to have to wait for 10 minutes. Uh, then I will actually look up, you know, I'll, I'll be doing on my iPhone or iPad. I'll be uh, going through that lesson, looking up words, saving words, doing all of those things. So I think the big thing is finding dead time during the day so that you can put together an hour a day. And I don't think that's difficult to do. And just generally, what, what are some common mistakes people uh, run into the, uh, when attempting to learn a, a language at the beginning? Yeah, people are too demanding. They're expecting to remember things. Uh, they get mad if they forget things, when in fact, you're going to forget things. And to forget and relearn, forget and relearn, forget again and relearn, that's the process. And so don't get mad at yourself for, you know, for not being able to remember. Some of the most basic things you're going to forget. Later on, even six months, a year later, you're not going to get them. So people should be realistic, should... Uh, and, and uh, ideally, find content that you like, where you like the voice, where it's a subject of interest so that you can listen to it over and over again. Um, yeah, those are some of the things. I, when it comes to listening, I find I cannot just sit down and listen because then my mind will wander. But if I'm doing something else and I'm listening at the same time, you know, I accept the fact that my mind wanders, but it doesn't matter. I listen to the thing so often that my mind will focus in at different times but uh, whereas if you just sit down and say, now I'm going to listen for half an hour, I'm going to listen to Spanish, your mind will wander and eventually you'll just give up because it's, it's just the, the idea that you're actually getting something else done while listening to the language is, is very motivating in a way. So those are some of the things I would suggest to people. Don't be too deliberate about the process. Well, maybe just as a comment, like I, I have no experience using Link, but uh, I know, John, you do. Uh, already from, from what you're telling me, Steve, it sounds much more exciting that you can listen to anything that you're interested in. So I, 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 right. I did do some Duolingo for, for a while. And one thing that frustrated me about that was that I'm just learning stuff that, that's, that's boring to me, that I'm not really interested in. And it's like you said, why, why right. do I need to know all the colors? Why do I need to know all these different foods? You know, I want to I wanna be able to, to, to talk more on a street level to, to people about things. Right. You know? So I think already that's quite uh, uh, quite exciting to me. Uh, and uh, how did you come up with with that idea of, of of mining? I guess mining the internet for content and and sculpting that into uh, in, in, into into lessons. I guess you know it's very funny. We started out and we started out developing Link for Chinese immigrants to Canada, and we began by interviewing a bunch of Rotary members, and because these were skilled immigrants from China who are from Taiwan who didn't really understand how Canadian society worked. So we wanted to give them something that they could listen to and learn the language and start to understand how our society worked. And in fact, 
the Rotary members also agreed to meet with them, fireside chat once every two weeks. And so it was, it was kind of a neat, uh, sort of a neat program. And so, and then we had all this uh, methodology for looking at words and saving words and stuff like that. And I had a neighbor who had been part of the sort of dot com boom. And he said, you're going to have to do one thing. He said, you have to make it such that anything on the internet can be brought in and all of your functionality will work. Percentage unknown words, all the stuff that we do that you have now done for the stuff that's in your library, you have to make it so that anything that comes in that can be, you know, would, would be handled the same way. And he said, don't listen to what the monkeys tell you. To him, programmers were monkeys. He said, don't listen to what the monkeys tell you. Tell them to make it happen. So we don't call our programmers monkeys, but uh, they were able to make it happen. And I think that's huge. And now it's it's one click. It's a browser extension and whatever you're reading or listening to, Netflix, whatever, it comes in. And uh, so, yeah, it, it means that we can have stuff in our libraries that's that's at the early stages and then anything people want. I, I had a, a question about endangered languages. And do you think that societies have an, ob an obligation to keep dwindling languages alive? Uh, you know, I know Duolingo claims to teach endangered languages and... I might be harsh here, but but I kind of think this is pointless. Should should we be saving languages from extinction? Well, first of all, I don't think obligation is a great motivator when it comes to languages. In Canada, French is uh, one of our two official languages. Most kids at school are not very motivated to learn French uh, because it's the official language or one of the official languages. You got to get people interested. So if there are people interested in, I don't know, Maori or some Aboriginal language or native language in Canada, like somebody's got to be interested in doing that. And um, so a lot of this stuff sometimes becomes a bit of a, what they call virtue signaling, right? I mean, it's not going to survive if people aren't interested. And, and often too, like, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in Canada, like it's a great opportunity for all the consultants to come in and latch on to government funding and stuff. And they all do stuff that's relatively useless. Basically, and we've had people come at us for native languages in Canada, and I say, look, we'd, we'll put up any native language as long as you can get people to speak, create the many stories, and get get us those, you know, the audio and that. And if there's uh, online dictionaries for the language, we'll put it up there. Fine. And they're very disappointed to go off. We never hear from them again because what they want is they want funding. You know, it's one of these things. They, they're looking at it. It's like something they can latch on to to keep people busy, right? So – funding the the, the we call it the, the gravy train the gravy train absolutely and and that's the same with even like uh, official language instruction in canada like all these people so-called helping the immigrants they don't they don't see link as as a as a plus because in fact it uh, it reduces their opportunity for government funding they want to put bodies in classrooms so they can get more funding they're not interested in something that's going to help the immigrants learn english you know or french so, so I think the, the native language thing, I mean, there were a lot more languages and the world has become a smaller place, I hope. I would love to see these languages survive, but you have to, you have to get enough speakers. It has, to be, it has to come from the speakers themselves that they're willing to say, okay, you know, if you look at, at Wales and Ireland, uh, the Welsh have managed to create a critical mass in favor of uh, Welsh Gaelic and, uh, and the Irish haven't. And, uh, so maybe they'll turn that around, and if they do, good for them. But it's got to be the speakers of the language themselves who have to make it happen. Well, Steve, I've just got a, f a few intermediate-level questions for you. Um, I've been learning Japanese for several years now, and um, uh, when I meet a Japanese person in, ca in a casual setting, we do the introductions, we cover the basics, but very soon I start to panic and I get the urge to flee the conversation before I start making mistakes. Is this something you've encountered? Uh, I don't mind making mistakes. So as long as they're willing to humor me, I'll hang in there. And the big advantage of being with a native speaker is that uh, he is, or she is giving you input, meaningful input, because you you want to have a conversation with them. So I don't really worry that much about, obviously when it's over, I go, phew, I'm glad that's over because it's very tiring. It's very tiring. and, and uh, But that tiring you know, encounter is very good for you. It's forcing you to try and use the language. But 
you know, as long as if they're willing to humor you in Japanese, then that's good. And you just, however well you do. And very often you do better than you think. And you think you didn't do very well, but in fact you did. The other person actually understood what you had to say and was having a conversation. And you're mad at yourself because you didn't quite say it as elegantly as you would have liked. So, no, I mean, yeah, I, I'd like to do better, but even if I don't do so very well, I, I, you know, I'm more comfortable speaking the languages that I speak well. And once you get past the initial stages, you enter, I mean, there's different names for it, but there's this sort of the middle part that people, I guess, say is a bit of a plateau or a or a dip or something. Right. Or a, And I certainly feel like um, no matter, I do an enormous amount of listening and I do my kanji practice and all that stuff, but I, I just feel like I'm not progressing. What, what, how, how, yeah, very normal, very normal. You know, the brain learns, but the brain learns slowly. So you have to find things that you enjoy doing. For continue your listening and reading, finding every opportunity to speak, not worrying too much about how you do. You just, you have to accept the fact that, uh, you know, when you first start in a the language, there's a lot of new words, a lot of high frequency words. You're learning these, you're seeing these quite often because they're high frequency. And then after a while, there's fewer and fewer high frequency words. There's more and more, you know, words that don't show up that often. And so you have the sense that you're not progressing very much. You just got to stay, stay the course. And, and ultimately, probably to do very well, you'd have to go to Japan or something. It's hard to do if you're not in an environment where you're surrounded by the well, language. I knew you were going to say that, Steve. So, and the, another uh, uh, sort of intermediate to uh, advanced issue. Um, well, let's just say you're, you, you know, you're in this where I'm at with with this language, but then you get the pangs of you like, oh, I wouldn't mind learning Italian, you know. So, what is it prohibitive to learn two languages at the same time? No, not at all. And it depends what you're interested in. You, your motivation is so important. If you're more motivated to go and do some Italian, then I would do Italian. And maybe go 80% Italian, 20% Japanese, if that's, you know, make that the minor language for a while. And even if you were to leave your Japanese and go into Italian and six months come back to your Japanese, you would be amazed how much your Japanese actually improves while you're not on it. I've, I've experienced this many times, and, and other people have agreed that this is what I call this period of benign neglect, where you just don't do anything in the language and it continues to develop in your brain. And when you come back to it refreshed, then you start to learn better again. So I, 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 like you don't have, it's not like you have to do, write an exam, you have no obligation in the language. No harm in, in exploring another language, in my okay. opinion. Well, maybe uh, as we start, uh, start to wrap things up, just thinking about our listeners and hopefully we've addressed some of their, their uh, 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 objections of why they, you know, uh, should, um, you know, maybe dip into some languages. But the, but the main uh, objections or obstacles I, I hear over and over again are, are really simple. It's uh, you hear I'm too old to learn a language. And I've heard, I've heard people mm-hmm. say this who... Um, you know, are barely 40, you know, or, or, or even all the way up to, um, you know, uh, uh, people who are, are much older. But then the second objection is I'm, I'm just no good at learning languages. What's your perspective on these two? Well, I once had a person say, oh, well, you know, once you get older, you can't learn languages. And I said, what do you consider older? Oh, he's at 40. <laughs> well, I was already past 70. I'm 77 now, so... <laughs> I think I'm just as good at learning languages now as I won as I was 50 years ago. Maybe not as good, but it's just, it's kind of the same thing as the talent for languages thing. In other words, assuming let's assume that I don't learn languages as well today as I did when I was 20. I don't consider I, I don't think there's a significant difference, but let's say there is. So what? Uh, let's say that some people are better at languages than others. So what? So therefore, I'm not going to bother. Uh, you know, I can't hit a golf ball like Rory McIlroy, therefore I'm not going to play golf. Uh, you know, maybe some people are better. It doesn't matter. If you're interested, if you are motivated, it doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what you think your talent level is. You can learn. Everyone can learn. Some people may be better at imitating pronunciation. Some people may be better at, you know, remembering certain things. It doesn't matter. And it's not the main factor. The main factor always comes down to motivation and time. 
you are motivated and you put in the time, you will learn. Some may learn faster, some may pronounce better, but everyone can learn. Well, I think that's uh, that's a great way to wrap things up. Uh, we, we do have one final question that we do ask all our guests, and we would like to know what you're reading right now and in what language. Okay, well, right now I am I am listening to and reading in Polish. Uh, actually, two books. One is a, a history of Poland, and the other is actually a book written by an American about the uh, Great Famine in Ukraine, but I managed to get a Polish audiobook and ebook version of that book about the Holodomor in Ukraine, right? But I'm also reading a book on the history of the Roman Empire in English, and I just finished reading a book on the history of the Greeks, not just Greece, but the Greeks all over the place. So I like history. Do, do, do you ever read, uh, just, just quickly, do you ever read uh, the same book in, in different languages? I think I have read, this is Anne Applebaum's book on uh, Red Famine. I might have read it in English, I don't remember. But I was looking for a book, I was scanning different Polish websites where I could find both an audiobook and an ebook, because I like to match the two. I import the ebook into Link, which is one click, I got the whole ebook, and then I go on to the uh, app of this Polish publisher, and then I listen to uh, the audiobook but other than that not not so much no well steve uh i will plug your uh app because i am uh, an avid user of it it's uh link i think everyone should use it and i'm going to say what steve can't say and that it buries duolingo all right um i know we shouldn't <laughs> criticize others but i just did it i don't care i'm rock and roll so everyone should get on to link uh, to learn their languages and where, where can people find you uh, online steve if they want to follow your work well, I have a YouTube channel called Lingo Steve, L-I-N-G-O, like Lingo Steve. And that would be the main thing. And, and there I basically either have my own sort of monologue rant where I talk about language learning and try to encourage people. And sometimes I speak in other languages and sometimes I interview other people. So Lingo Steve on YouTube. And of course, L-I-N-G-Q link is where, where I learn languages. And certainly would encourage people to check it out. That's excellent, Steve. Well, I've, I've been inspired to dust off my Indonesian, so thank you. We do have Indonesian on link, by the way. That's great. Thanks so much, Steve. Okay, well, I enjoyed it. Very interesting indeed. Thank you for listening to the New Flesh Podcast. If you like our work, please consider rating us on Apple Podcasts or even writing us a review. It really does help the show reach a wider audience. We'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, long live the New Flesh.